Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon, and then I post it up to Facebook. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka, done. I would like to thank my Wednesday sponsor, Future.co. So I have lost 15 pounds now working with a trainer, which is awesome. They are online. You can take them anywhere. They're on your phone. So you can take and you can customize those workouts for you with future.co. So future.co, if you're interested in getting into shape, if you're interested in taking care of your body this year, I think this would be a great idea. So future.co, get your trainer. They can customize it to you working in your office. So you can do like little tiny 15 minute workouts all the way up to, you know, hour-long workouts. So thank you, future.co. Okay, there that is. All right, so bunches and bunches of really good questions. So one of them I got through Facebook. So somebody was asking me, what is the difference between um, attachment disorder, so like avoidant, uh, fearful, uh, anxious attachment, and narcissism? Tons. Okay, let's talk about attachment styles. So there are four types. There is secure, secure meaning that, you know, mom and dad, they go away, the kid is secure, they know that mom and dad's coming back, everything's good, they're confident, they're secure, there's there's no fear, there's no fear of the mom and dad not, you know, taking care of them or disappearing and not taking care of them or things like that. So secure, secure attachment means it's all good. The mom and dad can go, kid is secure that mom and dad are coming back, okay? The next uh, ones are anxious. Uh, also referred to as preoccupied. So anxious meaning the child is not sure that the kid, or that the kid, that the adult is coming back. So in other words, if the child has a parent that is disordered themselves, is an alcoholic, is a drug addict, maybe they're there, maybe they're not. And so that child develops a very anxious kind of way of being, you know, it's like they're not sure that mom and dad are going to, or the caregivers are going to come back. So they're very anxious. Are they coming back? Are they not coming back? Are they coming back? Are they not coming back? Oh my God. So they're kind of freaked out, preoccupied. Okay. The next one is avoidant, also referred to as dismissive. So avoidant is where mom and dad didn't come back. The kid knows they're not consistent, knows they're not going to take care of them. And so they do not engage. They're like, uh-uh, we're not doing this. I, kn I know you're not coming back. I'm not going to attach myself to you because all you're going to do is hurt me. Okay? So that's kind of the avoidance. They're, they're not interested in having a relationship. And then disorganized, also refer referred to as fearful avoidance. So they're full of fear. They're full of anxiety. And sometimes they're attached and sometimes they're not. It's like... It's really back and forth, and it's because of the inconsistent caregiving. Now, narcissists will say, oh, I've got an attachment disorder. No, they don't. So the way that narcissists are avoidant is they avoid intimacy because intimacy requires emotion. And if there is one thing that narcissists do not have and will never possess, it is emotions. They will never have that empathy cog. So, narcissism is the following. And I know we've gone over this before, but it never hurts to brush up on it so that everybody understands exactly what we are talking about. Okay, hold on. Okay, here we go. All right, a pattern, a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, need for admiration, constantly fishing for compliments, that kind of thing, and lack of empathy. They have no empathy. They cannot put themselves into another person's shoes and go, oh my God, how must that feel? Okay, they're unable to do it. Beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts as indicated by five or more of the following. One, has a grandiose sense of self-importance. For example, exaggerates achievements and talents and expects to be recognized as superior without commiserating achievements. So in other words, they didn't go to an Ivy League school 
but yet they expect to be treated as if they did and and or they um they lie about you know serving in the military they lie about their education they lie about where they've been and who they talk to and who they're friends with and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, number two, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. So they need to have the best of 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 everything. And they are literally obsessed by it. And they have these fantasies that they're better than everybody else. They truly do. They do not understand that, you know, they're no better than anybody else. They are human, but they think they are better than everyone else. And so they, they expect compliance with their whims. Um, they think that they are unlimited in their success and, and in their power. And they think that they can control people. They really do. Um, okay, number three. Believes that he or she is special and unique and can only be understood by or should associate with other special or high status people or institutions. So they don't want to bother themselves with the peons, so to speak. They want to associate themselves with winners or with high status people or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're, they think that they're better than everybody else and they want to associate with people that they perceive as being better than everybody else. So that they're like, oh, look at me. I'm associated with this restaurant or this chef or this star or this, you know, politician or whatever. Um, four, requires excessive admiration. So constantly fishing for compliments, constantly looking to be told that they're great, okay? has a sense of entitlement, for example, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. So in other words, they are the type that will show up at a restaurant 45 minutes late for their reservation and expect to get the best seat in the house and no questions asked and will pitch a fit if they don't. So they think that they're better than other people and that they expect people to recognize their superiority and to comply with their demands. And they're constantly late. They are the type that show up to reservations 45 minutes late and expect to be seated. You know, it's just it's the arrogance, arrogance, arrogance is insane. You don't see the arrogance necessarily with attachment disorders. Okay is interpersonally exploitive, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own end. Remember, we have no more meaning to them than this phone, okay? We are an object to be used. And so if they can use us to get their ends met, their narcissistic supply met, they will. Lacks empathy, is unwilling, unwilling, not unable, un willing to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. They don't want to be bothered with emotion. It makes them angry. If you start crying in front of a narcissist and you're being genuine, you're showing true genuine emotion, whether that's crying or whether that's true anger or laughing, they'll get angry. I'll tell you what, it, when somebody gets mad at me because I laugh, oh, that tells me everything I need to know about that person. They cannot handle genuine, real emotions. Ever. Like, ever. So, there's, there's that. Um, is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. So, it's a jealousy thing. It's like they're jealous of other people. It's a competition, you know, and, oh, this person is jealous of me because I'm so great. And, you know, this whole delusional thing. Yeah shows haughty or arrogant behaviors or attitudes. That is narcissism. So with attachment disorders, they avoid because they're afraid of being rejected. With narcissism, they don't have the emotion cog. They don't. They don't know how to be a human being, really, basically. Um, they can recognize when someone's suffering, but it makes them angry. So two totally different things. So I hope 
that answers the question. Okay, let's go to the next question. Dun, dun, dun. All right. How do we know what fear feels like when you have CPTSD? Well, fear causes us to have CPTSD. So it's the hyperventilating. It's the, you know, racing thoughts. It's the, you know, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, that kind of thing. So, you know, it, it, when we have PTSD, we are filled with fear. And that is what drives the panic attacks. That is what drives sometimes the maladaptive behavior, trying to stay safe. You know, so we start avoiding things. Oh, well, yeah, this is where that accident happened on the road, PTSD, right? So I'm going to avoid that intersection. That's what happens all the time. So um, let's see if I answered that one. Uh, how do we know what fear feels like when you have CPTSD? Flashbacks, 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 panic attacks, um, obsessing racing thoughts. That's all fear-based. That is all fear-based. So um, get with a good trauma therapist and start working on helping, helping yourself. CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. So fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Fear is there to kind of keep us safe, but when it gets over activated, when it gets over stimulated, it stops us. It stops us from living. It stops us from doing things. It stops us from going out and being the best person we can be. So anyway, there is that. Okay. How to get enough when they sabotage any form of self-care compared to feels like sneaking a cigarette when we must take time to do self-care and do it so the abuser doesn't notice, feels like they don't want you to care for yourself because that may give you time to repair your wings enough to fly away from them. Absolutely. So here's the deal. Narcissists absolutely do not want you to care for yourself. 110%. They will sabotage anything that is going to give you independence. Absolutely. They'll sabotage your job. They'll sabotage your relationships. They'll sabotage your self-care routine. They'll sabotage your eating. They'll sabotage your exercising. They'll sabotage everything. They literally do not want you to spend any of your own time or attention or money on anybody except them. Okay? So they will get jealous if you go and buy yourself a new pair of shoes. Well, where's my new shoes? They literally will do that. You know, if you buy yourself something, by God, you'd better bring home something for them. It's like dealing with a two-year-old. It really is. A demonic, evil two-year-old, but a two-year-old nonetheless. So um, so it's like dealing with a two-year-old. And so they do stop us. They don't want us to get physically healthy. They don't want us to be mentally healthy. Why? Because you're right. We'll leave. We'll leave. We'll figure it out. We'll go, you know what? We're done. We're done here. And we'll leave. That's exactly what their goal is. Ultimately, the goal of every abuser is to kill their target of abuse, either physically or a soul death. They want us dead. They're angry as hell that we feel, we love, we are compassionate, we can feel other people's emotions, and they can't. And it angers them to the core. That's why they hate real emotion. That's why when somebody cries in front of them or is laughing in front of them or is truly angry in front of them, they get pissed because they can't feel it. They can not They can limit an emotion. They're great with anger, but they're not good with any other emotion. And they hate us for it. So yeah, they absolutely want us dead. So if you're noticing that somebody is stopping you from doing self-care, you've got to get the hell out of there. You have got to get the hell out of there. They want you dead. 110%. You can take that to the bank and earn interest on it. So you need to leave. That's the best advice I can give. Um, why would toxic family try to hoover you and keep calling you after they treated you bad and tried to kick you out and then you leave? Because it's a game for them. It's a game. It's drama. It's drama. So you're the greatest entertainment, seriously, for them. So what they do is, is they will create drama and then the person gets fed up and leaves the family, right? Usually the black sheep gets fed up and says, that's it. You people are crazy. I'm out of here. 
leaves, and then you have the parental units calling them. Oh, come, you know, move back. We, you know, it'll be different. Oh, da, da, we miss you, blah, 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 blah. No, what they miss is the drama. And now when the scapegoat leaves, right, now the crazy family of origin has to find another scapegoat. That's always the reason why they want the original scapegoat back so that it's, it's like a game of not it, right? So they don't want to be the scapegoat. They don't want, they want the original scapegoat back so that they don't have to deal with mom and dad or whoever the problem is. So it's a game. It's a game. It's absolutely a game. And it's a way to stir the pot. It's a way to get drama. It's a way to get chaos. They need drama and chaos the way the rest of us need oxygen. Like seriously, if it's not a drama fest, if it's not like a soap opera, holy cow, they're not happy. Because to them that's normal is boring. Normal is boring to them. They need to have that heightened everybody's in chaos, everybody's fighting with everybody else, everybody's yelling at everybody else, everybody's unhappy. That's their normal. And they want that to be our normal. And that is not normal. That is not normal. Life does not need to be difficult. But they want it to be difficult because it's exciting to them. Exciting in all the wrong ways. Dear Lord, I can go travel the world and find excitement. Thank you very much. So, yeah, that's why they call the scapegoats back. That's why they're constantly trying to get whoever left the family back. Because once the scapegoat leaves and goes no contact... Now the family roles are all going to start shifting. So, you know, who's it? Who's who's the scapegoat now? So there's that. Okay, let's see. Did I answer all the questions? Anxious, avoiding. Okay, yeah, I answered that. Yep, answered that. Yep, answered that. Yep, 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 answered that. Okay, got all of those. Okay, so this week on um, We Need to Talk with Chris Godinas, I'm going to be having my special guest, Marsha Diane, on she is a fellow therapist. She's a wonderful person. I love her so much. She is calm, cool, collected, very uh, metaphysical. I really love that about her. So she's going to be on. She's going to be talking about her new book that she has out. Um, she's also got a uh, mastery program out. Um, so she's just awesome. And we're going to talk about, you know, how to regain your power, how to... Um, how to really get get your mojo back, basically, is what it is. Because, boy, howdy, when we leave these abusive relationships, whether it's a family of origin or whether it's a romantic relationship or even a boss relationship, coworker, friend, it really does knock the wind out of our sails. And it does kind of knock us down. And so we got to learn what to do to get ourselves back up on the horse and keep on riding. So that's what we're going to talk about with Marcia Diane on the 5th. Of February. Holy cow, it's going to be the 5th of February. What the actual? Anyway, there that is. All right. So, all right, my loves. You guys go be good. Thank you, future.co. You guys be good. Have a great week, and I will talk to you on Sunday. Bye.